Welcome into the Tuesday edition of the Locked On Leafs podcast, where it's officially the offseason, Dave. The Colorado Avalanche are Stanley Cup champions. Uh, we'll break down that game a little bit and kind of put a bow on the playoffs as well, put a ball in the year, I guess, as the whole season kind of gets wrapped up and the offseason is uh, is now underway. And the Leafs officially making a move on the first day of uh, the offseason, inking themselves a young defenseman to an extension. We'll tell you who that is. There's some chatter about Jack Campbell's future. We'll tell you about that as well. And there's a new crop of Hall of Fame inductees that were announced today. We'll tell you who they were, who was snubbed, including one former Toronto Maple Leaf on today's edition of Locked on Leafs. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Leafs podcast, your one-stop shop for all things Leafs. I'm your host, Mike DiStefano from TSN 1050 Toronto Radio, also known as Al's brother on TSN's Overdrive and TSN 1050's Leafs Lunch. Joining me is my co-host, Dave Morissuti from Sportsnet, also a writer for the NHLPA. Locked On Leafs is a daily Maple Leafs Century podcast, so be sure to subscribe for free. Wherever you get your podcasts from, you can also now catch us up on video. That's Locked On Leafs on YouTube. <clears throat> Dave, the offseason's here, pal. We've got a couple of Leafs-related news to get into already, of course. You know, Kyle Dubas doesn't like to wait too, too long before getting aggressive. I bet he's been a little antsy as he's let the the playoffs kind of play out before doing a whole lot here. But, uh, yeah, there's a, a, a Timothy Lilligren has been signed to an extension. We'll chat about what that could mean uh, for him and the expectations upon that. Also chat a little bit about Jack Campbell in just a moment in the Hall of Fame class of 2022. But why don't we put a bow on uh, on the season that was with the Stanley Cup final. The Colorado, Colorado Avalanche uh, defeating the Tampa Bay Lightning 2-1 to one to knock off the back-to-back champs. The new kings of the NHL as the Avs win it in six games. Um, I mean, what were your thoughts on that game overall? I thought that the Avs... They put on a clinic, and they said to themselves, we're not losing this one. We're not making this one go seven. We're going to end it right here in six. And guys like Nathan McKinnon showed up huge to make sure that that happened. They really just did, gave them nothing in the third period. And, uh, boy, what a dominating playoff run for the Colorado Avalanche culminating in a Stanley Cup. Yeah, only four losses, all playoffs. Yeah. That that is pure dominance. Like they they had probably the toughest. Like they had such a tough road to get there. Even even Tampa had a tough road, but like yeah, Tampa, Tampa had a tougher road. I, I think uh, was it Steven Stamkos afterwards said when you look back on the road to get there, he said we had to go through the league MVP in yeah. Austin Matthews, the Presidents Trophy winners in Florida, and then you had to go against the Vesna winner and Igor Shosturkin in uh, the Eastern Conference Final, and then, you know, the champs in the fourth round. So I think yeah. <laughs> the Lightning and probably had a bit of a and tougher they, And they did not have home ice advantage. In none of them. None of them. Zero of them. Yeah. So that, that definitely went against them. I, I just think that Tampa just officially just, they ran out of gas. Like, I think just also the injuries caught up to them finally. Yeah. We heard John Cooper say that half of the AHL team would have been playing if this was a regular season. You know, if this was a regular season. A lot of co- I, in Colorado had their fair share of uh, injuries. You know, Nichushkin being one. Kadri couldn't even tie his own skate. Yeah. Nazem Kadri is supposed to be a six-week return. That was the, the rest and recovery time mm-hmm. for thumb injury. They somehow shaved it down to just two weeks he put in the work to get ready and uh he was able to go out there and play and obviously had the game winner in in um uh his return in game number five and then goes out and gets that one in game six or game four rather and then in game six you know able to hoist the stanley cup when all said and done but Nazem Kadri, look, we we love him, man. I'm I'm super happy for the guy, super happy for the guy. And he had a little bit of a comment 
which realistically might be some of the listeners to this podcast. Why don't we pull up uh, pull up the the mic drop moment that Nazem Kadri had to all the haters out there who said that Naz was a liability and you know he, he had they had to move him out of Toronto because he just couldn't trust them in the playoffs anymore. Well, Naz has a little bit of uh, a uh, some words for you. I mean, I've had supporters in my corner from day one, never wavered. And, uh, you know, for everyone that thought I was a liability in the playoffs, you can kiss my ass. <laughs> oh, I love it, man. I love it. Yeah. And, and look, man, like I was, I'm partly one of those people, right? I'm one of those people and I got my tail between my legs today. It's not that I wanted Kadri gone, but I didn't hate the trade when it first happened. Obviously, looking back on it, one probably the worst trade of Kyle Dubas's career. Um, but I'm still happy for the guy that he was able to go in there, uh, get healthy enough to to just make it back for those final few games and help his team win a Stanley Cup. And you know, he woke up today a champion. I think that's pretty cool for Nazem Kadri. You're on mute, pal. There we go. Okay. I wanted to make sure there was no <laughs> echo when we played the video. I know. Um, look, the trade is the trade. It happened because it wasn't just the Leafs needed to move Kadri because of what happened in the playoffs. It was also the Leafs desperately needed to find a right shot defenseman. No, the, the Colorado Avalanche trade was not the first trade they wanted to do. Let's not forget that as well. But you, if you're if you're still salty about that trade, I feel for you. I really do. I've kind of moved on, and I know that this just opened up old wounds, and it's tough. But you also, I, I also like the fact that a lot of fans were really happy for Kadri. Yeah, people thought this was a dig at least management. I kind of thought it was a little more towards the the media and those who kind of you know wrote Kadri. Probably both. Yeah. Probably. I I would say probably both just because, you know, there was a lot talked about, you know, what he had, you know, the, that last series and everything that happened. So we, I think it is time for everything to just move on. Kadri didn't suffer because of it. He's very happy with what happened. I think, you know, obviously he was sad at, 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 in that moment, but, can't argue with what the results came about after. Yeah, he was he was fantastic. And just like from top to bottom, that team, I mean, they they were dominant. I mean, you said it, they were 16 and four throughout the playoffs. And if you also go and you take a look at the numbers, they scored more goals than anybody else in these playoffs. And also when you look at the expected goals against, they're also the best defensive team in the league. So best offensive team, best defensive team. It's it, the, the defensive side of things, I think, is what really didn't get talked about enough with Colorado. But, like, you had guys like Nachushkin who were playing so good two-way game. You know, you had dudes like McKinnon making unbelievable back checks. Like, everybody bought in. The, the whole squad, top to bottom, bought in. And then you clearly, you know, Devontae's, Bowen Byram. Bowen Byram turned into a real player these playoffs. He's arrived on the scene. That guy is going to be a stud defenseman for a very long time in this league. And just overall, man, I thought that uh, that, that team deserved to win. Jared Bednar, the first coach to ever win in the ECHL, the AHL, and now the NHL. Um, so that's just impressive. The guy wins everywhere he goes, apparently. And I just think that it's really cool that you look at a team who had a vision for many years and they kind of kept it and believed in themselves. And eventually they got over the hump and they finally got to the promised land and, and last night won that Stanley Cup. And to bring it back around, I guess, to the Maple Leafs, it's, you know, maybe Toronto. If if you, you keep this core intact, because the, the, the Avs were in a similar position a couple of years ago yeah. where, you know, there was there was discussions should we fire the coach should we fire joe sackick can we get this thing going we've you know time and time again we're getting eliminated in the in the first second round we can't get over the hump of that second round and then eventually this year um they kept going one more kick at the can year after year and this year they finally kind of kicked the doors down uh through to the second round got to the conference final blew past edmonton and then uh 
put a bit of a, a bit of a butt kicking realistically on the Tampa Bay Lightning. The expected goals was six, like sixty percent of the expected goals in favor of of Colorado, like two thirds basically of the goals going in favor of Colorado. They were just just unbelievable, unbelievably dominant. And uh, if Vasilevsky was just league average, that would have been a disgusting, disgusting beatdown by Colorado in uh, in that series. So I guess that's uh, off to the avalanche. I also just think if Vasilevsky's average at any point in this playoffs is called the Tampa Lightning or nowhere near the Stanley Cup final. But no, it was... I will say this was probably one of the better Stanley Cup finals I have watched in a really long time. Absolutely. It was awesome, man. The, the playoffs in general, like from start yeah. to finish, uh, typically <clears throat> there's a bit of a lull somewhere in the playoffs. You didn't get that this year, man. Like the first round is always terrific. And then round two, you had the Battle of Alberta. That was extremely entertaining. That was great hockey, along with the the uh, St. Louis and Colorado battle. That was a great series as well. And then you had the conference final. And both of those series were terrific themselves, too. I mean, I know that the the Western Conference was a sweep, but they were highly entertaining games, at the very least, extremely entertaining with McDavid versus McKinnon. Um, But, yeah, the the playoffs as a whole, man, uh, were fantastic. And, you know, it was the first year that ESPN and TNT had the rights down in America. And I think that the NHL put on one heck of a show to try and drive up viewership and Hopefully they can retain a lot of those new eyeballs that they were able to get throughout the year. And, you know, they can really grow the game of hockey down south. I think that was the intention when they decided to sign on with ESPN and TNT. And I think uh, year one, certainly a success. And and I hope that it can, you know, keep going, uh, going forward. No, I, I think it's only going to, I, I read uh, Luke Fox's story after this, uh, pretty much after the the, fi- the final uh, buzzer. And he kind of just said that this is good for hockey in terms of the way that Colorado plays, the offensive style. You know, yeah. one, like just that exciting brand of hockey is what the NHL should be trying to push for more of. I understand that in the playoffs, you want to see that competitiveness, good defense. But in the end, a lot of the the fun and like the wild moments of these playoffs came during a lot of great offensive performances. Colorado had many of them. So did Edmonton. That's what the league wants. And that's what helps sells the league in my opinion. Yeah. hundred percent. You can even look at game six, third period. They've got a one, nothing lead. Typically you see teams just kind of, you know, buckle down and just play a little bit reserved defensively and they don't give you anything. They were balls to the wall, buddy. They were pedal to like pedal to the metal and they were going. And, you know, sometimes they say the best defense is a good offense. And that's kind of what the avalanche did with, with just kept trying to provide offense and try and build on that lead that they had in the third period, as opposed to sitting back and trying to, to just kill clock. And although they didn't find the back of the net in the third period, because Vasilevsky was so stellar, they didn't give Tampa any opportunities no. either. They had four shots the entire period. And, None of them were great age chances, really. Um, so yeah, pretty pretty clinical finish there for the Colorado Avalanche. And um, to me, going into the year, they looked like the best team on paper. And uh, it's not so often that the best team on paper ends up hoisting Lord Stanley's mug at the end of the year, but it certainly was Colorado this season. And uh, you know, they end the 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 two year reign of the Tampa Bay Lightning, but. I have a feeling we might see these two again in the future, potentially. Uh, it, it could definitely happen. Um, looks like Bet Online has the Avalanche as the top team to win the Stanley Cup next year the, with the best odds. And guess who's at number two? Oh, I know. Oh, I saw them. The good old Toronto Maple Leafs. No, Bet Online oh. actually, Bet Online has the Lightning at number two. Wow. That online's got the lightning at number two. Yeah, and I, I saw four. different odds then. Yeah, yeah, no, I, know. No. I, I got confused as well. But Bet Online's got the lightning as uh, with the second best cup odds going into next year. Avs number one, Leafs at number three though. David, Leafs at number three at uh, plus nine hundred. So uh, that's what uh, if you want to go and place a real way too early wager before you know who the starting goaltender is even going to be for Toronto. Be my guest. Go ahead. Uh, you can do that over at uh, 
Bet Online. And speaking of betonline.net, it's your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's NHL playoffs, the Major League Baseball. Bet Online is also your continued source for all your sport wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. And Bet Online remains at your best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. BetOnline, it's where the game starts. <clears throat> Welcome back into the Locked On Lease podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano. Got Dave Morissuti with me. We're hosts here at Locked On Leafs, a daily Maple Leaf centric podcast. So if you're a big time Leaf fan and it's your first time listening to us, Hopefully you're enjoying the conversation. We haven't quite gotten into the Leafs just yet, but we're about to right now. And if you are a diehard Leaf fan, make sure to subscribe to us because we'll be bringing you content even throughout the offseason. All throughout the offseason, we'll be bringing you shows. I think starting next week, it's dropping out to three days a week, though. But still, three days a week, full-on Leafs content throughout the offseason. And it's about to be silly season. It's about to be busy season. And it kind of started today, Dave. Um, with the Maple Leafs making a signing, Timothy Lilligren signing an extension, two years, $1.4 million annually. Your thoughts? Uh, caught me off guard a little bit. Like, it was good to see him sign. Then when I saw the number he signed at, I was like, it's not too shabby there, considering it was a two-year deal. You always think that the two-year deal, if, you, if you're buying another year, you're usually paying a little bit more. I was a bit surprised that... It was 1.4 per year for two years. I did read Jonas Siegel, who kind of said that if the Leafs did try to go for that one year, it could have actually been more expensive. More expensive. Well, more expensive in that it would have oh, been arbitration because then yeah. he would have arbitration next year and it could exactly. have turned out to be more money. But you're in the same boat two years from now, though. Exactly. Like you're still going to have to pay the guy. But I think this is the perfect situation for both the Leafs and for Lily Grin. Because Lilligren hasn't truly established himself as a full NHL player because we haven't seen him play a full NHL season. So I think this is a good opportunity for him to just not worry about the contract. He can play. He'll have to worry about it in the second year, but he at least can go and play and know that he has something to build towards. I think that's a good situation for both him and the Leafs. Yeah, I I, I mean, I, I think this is a pretty fair deal. Um, I was like, I don't want to say surprise. It's that's I wasn't surprised to see that he signed for like a reasonable contract for both sides. Um, but I almost felt like Toronto was going to kind of do what they did with Travis Dermott back when he was coming off his ELC and try and squeeze him right for about 950 K million dollars, maybe. Uh, but to your point, you know, Jonas Siegel pointed out, well, if he has a great season, uh, the arbitration, he could end up passing for more the following year. And now you're looking into paying more money AAV in that second year. Whereas you come to an agreement, two years, 1.4 million, a little bit of cost certainty there. And I think it's a fair deal on both sides. I mean, 1.4 million for a guy you're hoping becomes an everyday NHL or on your third pair, most likely, um, I-, I think makes a whole lot of sense. <clears throat> and you look at his season he ended up getting how many was it four fifth place votes for the the calder yeah. i want to say yeah he got four votes in the calder race. yeah one was uh dom decision was one of the guys and he's a big time analytics dude for uh for the athletic and timothy Lilligren, a little bit of an analytics darling in a, in a sense so that would make uh that would make some sense there but you know, he's a guy, five goals this year, 23 points in his first kind of full season-ish. Had played 61 games um, this year for Toronto, averaging s- just under 16 and a half minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it was a pretty good season for, for Timothy Lilligren. He took some big strides late in the year, too, once he got paired up with Timothy Lilligren. But then the playoffs kind of didn't go as well for him, and he ended up kind of sitting the pine uh, as Justin Hall came in and, and played the back half of the playoffs Uh, in that first round, but I think they're hoping he has a good summer. I believe I heard him say he's trying to put, put on a little bit of weight, get a little stronger going into next season. I think that'd be, that'd be big for them if that can be the case. Cause if it's anything that they need back there, especially on the right side, it's just a little bit more beef. And, you know, he's not an overly big guy, six foot. I think he's about 200 pounds. If he can 
tack on an extra 10 pounds of muscle and add something to his frame, some bulk to his frame, make it a little bit tougher to push around, make him a lot more of a, a guy who can battle net front, battle in the corners. I think that would bode extremely well for A, his development, and B, for the Maple Leafs going forward. Um, what do you think this means for, for Rasmus Sandin, though, David? Because now he's the the last man standing, I suppose. They now have six NHL defensemen signed to contracts and Sandine still as an RFA. Um, what does the deal look like for that guy? Or do you think potentially it, it looks still maybe likely that he becomes a bit of a trade piece this offseason? Yeah, I'm the interesting thing here is that Lily everyone's comparing Lily Grin and Sandine, right? So that's everyone's thinking, okay. Lily Green kind of set the bar a bit for Sandine, but it's clear here that Sandine visualizes himself in a bigger role, meaning he probably wants a little bit more. So maybe the Leafs have been trying to get him signed to that two year deal, and maybe he just wants that one year deal. And that's maybe where the issue lies. I, I just think Sandine clearly envisions himself in a bigger role than what he's currently have. And that's obviously impacted what his contract's going to be like. I'm, I'm, the it'll be interesting to interesting to see what if we get to a certain point where he's not signed, then you start wondering, hmm, like is there going to be some sort of stalemate in terms of look, Sandine just decides I'm just not going to sign right now because I don't feel like I'm getting what I want and I don't think I'm going to be in a role that's going to be beneficial for me. Yeah, um, I don't know where I sit with Sandine. I, I in a way, like I feel almost as though he's, you know, they're kind of one foot in one foot out with him and, and, you know, to, to get good players in, in return through trade. I mean, whether they want to get themselves a top six forward or they want to go out and uh, attack the, <clears throat> the goalie market, the goalie trade market, you got to give to get. And I feel like Sandine, who's an up and coming defenseman and, and he's somebody who, you know, has aspirations of being a top four guy. I think that's what um, his projection is. It, but it just doesn't work for Toronto right now. And a team that's win now mode, you know, you either need to kick him to the right side. And even then, like, if you look at the way that this team is built, I mean, it's, it's the, the, the spot that is open right now, when you look at it is technically top pair right side next to Morgan Riley, or you've you're next to Jake Muzzin, but it's a top four right shot spot. I'm not sold that Rasmus Sandin really fits the bill. I suppose you could try and move Lily up there and then have Sandin play there, but then you got to figure out something to do with Justin Hall, who is also in a contract for two million bucks. I don't know, man. I I almost feel like Sandin <clears throat> they could potentially use him in some sort of deal to uh, acquire, uh, you know, use your your strengths in one area to try and you know fill the needs in another and. Maybe Sandine could be the guy that could be used for that. I don't see him signing for more than Lilligren did, though. Like any contract he signs, I don't see it for being anything more than Timothy Lilligren is. Yeah, that's that's my thing, right? It's just not and not many teams outside of the Leafs are going to pay him that either, right? So he's yeah. got to kind of understand that he hasn't built himself up to being that, you know. He, he's he definitely has the potential, but it has he just hasn't shown yet. My wonder too is are the Leafs trying to figure out how the left side is really going to work? Right? Is it going to be Rasmus Sandin being moved, or is it potentially Jake Muzzin going to be moved? That's still up in the air in terms of that's a big ticket for Jake Muzzin. He had a good playoffs, but we saw what happened before the playoffs. <laughs> Does he have a no trade or a no move, Muzzin? I believe it's been changed to a no move. Yeah, I think it was uh, whatever designation it was last year. It did get changed this year. Yeah, no trade clause. The only he only had a no move in the first year of his deal. Okay, so so he still he's got a no trade. So he has um, is it a full no trade? It is a full no trade. It doesn't become modified until the following year. So he, so he would have to okay anything, right? So it gets a little bit more complicated. We know that Kyle Dubas looks at Jake Muzzin as part of that leadership core, um, and, and he believes in that core so, so much. So 
I don't know. Maybe they do um, find a solution there where they can move on from Muzzin and still uh, make it work. But at least you know what you have in Muzzin as an NHLer. Rasmus Sandin still has a lot to prove. Uh, and I don't know if you get better by taking Muzzin out of your lineup and replacing him with Sandine. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, one more quick thing, uh, Leafs note, before we move on to this year's Hockey Hall of Fame class. Larry Brooks, Brooksy, as everybody uh, knows him, as John Tortorella famously once said, that's what I'm saying, Brooksy. Uh, he was writing in the New York Post, apparently the New Jersey Devils have some significant interest in Jack Campbell and would be interested in trading for his rights should the Maple Leafs decide to move on from him. That's interesting. Um, I think they should probably consider doing it. Yeah, so here's the piece. Uh, I, I can't read that. You got to zoom in a little bit. <clears throat> my, my, I know. I know. You, all right. Well, hold <laughs> eyes, Mike. Hold eyes. There it is. Uh, there's a fair amount of chatter from multiple industry sources that the Devils will be in will be in on impending Toronto for agent goaltender Jack Campbell if he hits the open market on July 13th. So that is what uh, is being written by Larry Brooks and then the in uh, USA Today rather. Uh, we're told by one informant that New Jersey may attempt to jump the process by dealing for the 30 year olds' rights if the Maple Leafs cannot or will not extend the netminder who started more than 26 games from this year. And he goes on to say the idea would be to move Mackenzie Blackwood, whose career has somehow careened off course during a couple of drama-filled seasons uh, that this fragile team does not need. Um, so I don't know if that means potentially they're looking to move Mackenzie Blackwood back to Toronto in said deal. And, of course, this is coming from a, a New Jersey perspective from uh, reports that this is what they would like to do. It's not what Toronto is maybe thinking about doing. I mean, there could be some potential discussions between Toronto and Kyle Dubas and and uh, in New Jersey, but uh, this is just you know another one of those options that we've talked about so much. Maybe they do get a little bit creative and they deal away his rights, Jack Campbell's rights, and bring in a goalie like Mackenzie Blackwood, who a couple of years ago was a pretty good up and coming prospect goaltender. He's still relatively young, 25 years old. He has aspirations to be, you know, like a one, a starter in this league. Um, and he only makes, I believe 2.3 million bucks for the next couple of years. So rather cost, uh, cost friendly deal. Maybe, maybe that's the, the route that they go in. Um, just another, another dart that we can throw at our goaltending situation here. Uh, as the offseason progresses. All right, Dave, um, why don't we take one more quick break when we get back? Let's get into the Hall of Fame class. Uh, some real good ones, some real good ones. Um, a big Swedish connection as well. And also one Maple Leaf in particular that has a lot of people shaking their heads why he is not yet in the Hockey Hall of Fame and why he got passed over this year. We'll tell you who that is on the other side. You're listening to the Locked On Leafs podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Welcome back into the Locked On Podcast Network, or Locked On Leafs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. We could probably take that down now, Dave. I think we can we can get that out of there. A little get this. story about Brooksy. People need to look at our faces here. You need to look at our faces. Now we're back on YouTube. Sure, I got to get rid of some of the shine. <laughs> Dude, you got to go get whatever Phil Pritchard's boy was rocking on the top of his head the other day. That's what you got to go out and get yourself uh, to to help with that shine. Did you see the salad? Like the 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 ferret that the man was wearing on top of his head. I did. And are you considering? No, not at all. <laughs> not, not at all. I picture I picture you being like uh, Kevin from The Office, where when he goes to like weddings or big parties, he puts a little hairpiece on and tries to feel like no one would notice. It's like, dude, we see you every day. And you're bald as shit. And now, oh, whoops, we got to bleep that out. But you're bald as hell. And now you're sitting here with a hairpiece. You think we're not going to notice? That's how I feel like you're going to be one day. You're just going to come onto the podcast. You're going to be rocking a hairpiece and uh, hope that we don't notice that your scalp has been covered. 
But uh, anyways, moving on, David. Let's give the proper respect to the members that were nominated. No, not nominated. They're in, uh, they're now inducted. They got the call. They got the call to the hall. So um, four uh, former NHLers, a builder, and uh, a female hockey player also inducted into the uh, Hockey Hall of Fame class of 2002. This will happen, obviously, later in the fall where they'll officially get inducted. But uh, congratulations to the class. So it's Daniel Alfredson, Roberto Luongo, Henrik Sedin, Daniel Sedin. So the Sedin twins going in together, as we all figured would happen. Uh, uh, Rika Salinen, the first non-American or Canadian woman to get into the hall. So that's pretty cool. And then Herb Carnegie gets in there um, as part of the builder category. Uh, he's clearly has some Toronto ties as well, Herb Carnegie. Did you ever play at the the arena there? I mean, I didn't grow up in the city, so I I'm not familiar. But I know you did, so no, maybe you did. No, not not there. No, I know of it, but I've never been there. Yeah, here I heard it was a, a quality rink back in the day. Quality rink. Um, did you have any issues with any of these? fine players who got nominated into the hall of fame. I, there were some people out there who it's not that they had an issue with these players specifically getting into the hall, but it's more so that they got in over others um, that, you know, some out there believe were more deserving at this point in time. Um, look, like I, I, when it comes to the hall of fame, I just put their names up here so we can have them up here. Um, like you look at all these players and you, and you kind of say, yeah, maybe they didn't have to get in right away when it comes like the Sedins, maybe because this was their first year in Luongo. Maybe it wasn't, you know, a priority to get them in right away. Oh, but I mean, when you're first ballot Hall of it. Famer, you're first ballot Hall of Famer. It does mean a lot. I think like the Sedins definitely, and, and even Luongo too, um, there, there are people who are still being the drum. Like I'm, I'm a big Alexander McGillney guy. I think that guy should be in the hall of fame. That's the former Maple Leaf that I was kind of yeah kinda teasing. He's not going to get the Maple Leaf, but yeah, yeah, I knew who you who you were uh, talking about when it comes to uh, missing no. guys. I, and, and people kind of always bring up Paul Henderson too, right? Yeah, yeah, that, right. That that always continue like. He's he's in different Hall of Fames instead of the Hockey Hall of Fame, and I still think that's the one I always have an issue with. Um, I, I think he'll be one of those guys. Who was it? Was it Rogi Vashon who got in after like thirty years on the ballot, and eventually they were like, "Okay, you're gonna get now the honorary like old man nominee," and and he ended up getting. I feel like eventually Paul Henderson will end up in there. Um, just purely based on, you know, the, the summit series goal and, and what that meant for hockey. Like ultimately to me, the hall of fame is, is a museum that tells the the story and the history of hockey, whether it's the NHL, the international game, the women's game, whatever it may be, uh, KHL, the Finnish leagues, like, honestly, it's just hockey on this universe on the planet. And yeah, I'm, I'm with you where Paul Henderson you know, it's it's a name that's synonymous with Canadian hockey, not because he's one of the best players to ever play, because I don't think he is necessarily like a top 100 guy, but his impact that he had on the game based on like one goal in particular uh, certainly resonates and is something that probably should be in the Hall of Fame just because it, it's, it's, you know, the story. That's how you tell the story about the Summit Series. And, and how can you tell it without Paul Henderson? You know what I mean? And that's what I feel like the Hall of Fame is. It, it, like, it's it's just uh, essentially it's a museum of how the, the game evolved, how it's been told, celebrating the great players, the great plays, the great stories of the game. And and, and look, I've watched the, the, the documentaries on that Summit series. Yeah. The historical significance of that series and that goal right. alone I thought should have made him worthy of a uh, hall yeah. of fame as well. But these guys, I mean, that, that's, that's, it kind of leads me to why I, I'm apparently in 
I don't know if it's just the the loud minority out there who had a bit of a, an issue with like Daniel Sedin being a, a Hall of Famer over a McGillney or over a Ronick. Kachuk was another guy, Brenda Moore, another guy that, you know, was getting uh, thrown out there. Look, man, Daniel, first of all, the story of the Sedin twins to me is one of the most unique stories ever in the game of hockey. Like, just go, go back to their draft day. You do a 30-30 on, on, you know, the Sedin's draft day of Brian Burke starting with, like, the first pick, back to the fifth pick, up to the third pick, to the fourth, and he somehow gets picked two and three in the draft and takes the Twins second and third overall um, in a row. And they stick with the Canucks their entire careers, go on to, to go to multiple uh, all-star games, both of which won an Art Ross, one won an MVP, one won a Lester Pearson, which is the modern day Ted Lindsay, you know, and, and a first team all-star, second team all-star nominations. Like they legitimately had so much individual success. They never won the cup though. The Stanley Cup never ended up in Vancouver, which is also a reason why Roberto Luongo never ended up with a Stanley Cup because Florida also didn't win the two teams that he played for. Um so, interestingly enough, none of the four NHLers in this year's Hall of Fame class won Stanley Cup because no, neither did Alfredson. But I think the story about the Sedins, just to kind of circle back to it, is something that definitely belongs in the Hall of Fame. I, I 100% believe that. I mean, they both had well over a thousand points, you know, in their careers. Like, it's not like they were a joke. I mean, these two were very much, um, dominant dominant players stars yeah. in the nhl for a decade pretty well you know coming off of the the 05 lockout go look at their the 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 following decade from like the 05 lockout until about the mid maybe like seven eight years after that they up consistently between 70 and 100 points every single year and you know like i said all-stars first team uh all-star selections Heart trophies, Ted Lindsay's, like you just name it, man. Of course, they're Hall of Famers. I don't know why people are, are sitting here saying, ah, no way, no way that Daniel Sedin should have got in there over so and so. Nonsense. Their stats speak for themselves. Yeah. But the story about them together as twins, brothers, family members, making it all the way through their careers together in such a fashion that they did. No doubt in my mind they were going to be first ballot Hall of Famers. That's exactly what they were and became uh, yesterday. I, I loved watching them play, even though you're not cheering for them. You kind of just marvel at what they were able to do on the ice. Yeah. You know, they anybody that played with them, they had to kind of instruct that guy what they needed to do, which was pretty much stay out of our way. <laughs> don't, don't come near go us. Just go to the net, bang on rebounds. And Alex Burrow said – Yes, I will do that, and you will make me millions of dollars. Sounds good. Yannick Hansen, yep, I will go to the net. You'll make me millions. Anson Carter, yep, I will go to the net. You'll make me – like, go down the list. Look at any line mate that those guys had for a decade. And, uh, well, they made a lot of people a lot of money in the same vein that, like, Crosby did that. Now, obviously, they're not Sidney Crosby, but you know what I mean. Just whoever those guys played with always seemed to find – a level of success that they never were able to replicate. Yeah. And they, they were also, you know, one of those group of players you wish had won a Stanley cup. They had the best chance in t when, uh, when they lost to the Bruins, like we oh. thought that was the year. Dude, that was like, that was a dominant team. Dominant team should have won that year, but they had all the pieces to win. So, um, just glad that they're in the Hall of Fame, and even like with Alfredson, I understand there's that debate. What's I, the what's the what's the the meme there where it's like Leaf fans, Canuck fans, hating the Bruins, oh, shaking, yeah. hating the Bruins. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We feel you guys. We feel you. Screw you, Boston. Talking about hating? No, I'm joking. <laughs> Over like like even with Alfredson, like you kind of have to respect what that guy did in Ottawa. Everything he, he, I understand that as like nationally, some people don't really understand the impact Daniel Alfredson had, but somebody who watched him 
on the other side and didn't want to see him succeed. He, he was, he, I'm trying to think of the best way to kind of describe him and maybe compare, but like we, all these Swedes had a lot of international success, world championships and Olympic golds in 06. And that's part of it, right? That's part of the hockey hall. Not of fame. The, it's, not, it's not the NHL hall of fame. As I always say, it is the hockey hall of fame. Exactly. Which is why Rika Salonen is in there as one of the greatest Finnish women hockey players in the world. Right. That's why she's in there. Um, clearly didn't play in the NHL, didn't play overseas, but she's being represented because it's the mm-hmm. hockey hall of fame. And she's one of the greatest hockey players of all time and yet celebrated. Same with Sedin, the Sedin twins, Luongo, Alfredson, and Herb Carnegie. I think that the, it's, you know, I don't want to take anything away from this class, man. I think it's, it's a good class. Uh, the, the interesting thing is they have a combined zero Stanley Cups between them, which I, I don't know if that's ever happened before, where there's been a, an entire Hall of Fame class with zero Stanley Cups. It might be actually. Ooh. I'm not going to make you go through and find um, that. I'm trying to think even off the top of my head. Like, Well, I was thinking maybe if you saw a stat on that. I didn't see one. I was thinking maybe you saw something on Twitter talking about that, but um, nice. it was just something that I thought of recently. But, yeah, kind of a crazy wild stack. So we think of the Hall of Fame, you know, everyone says, like, oh, how many cups? How many cups? Mm, zero of the four NHLers making the Hall of Fame this year won a Stanley Cup, and they all got in. Um and Luongo and the Sedins first ballot guys over Stanley cup winners, like Rod Brindamore, um, you know, like Ronick and McGillney. And like, it's, it's kind of funny that, uh, I actually might've found the last potentially 2016. We had, yeah, 2016, we had Eric Lindros, Mm -hmm. Sergei Makarov, I don't think he won. He's a Russian. Yeah, he was Russian. Uh, he did not win a cup when he was in the NHL. And uh, Rogi, uh, oh. what's that? Vashon. Yeah. So they not none of those guys won a cup, from what I remember. So. Yeah. All right. So yes, it's not the first time that it's that it's happened. But this, it, it that was always the argument against a lot of those. Like nobody would ever argue against Eric Lindros. So that like, but like yeah. these guys, that was always the argument against them. Oh, they never won a cup. Doesn't matter. I I, I think contribution to hockey. There's other ways you can be a hockey hall of famer other than winning a Stanley Cup. Matt Sundin. I don't think any Leaf fan would argue about Matt Sundin being in the stand, in the hockey hall of fame. Nope. So, Leaf fans, just watch what you say about the other guys. Speaking of, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a list of players. Let me know if you think these guys are going to be hockey hall of famers at some point. Okay, a little bit of a of a rapid fire, rapid fire. Okay, Cujo. Yes. I was going to go through these snubs, but I think all of them are going to be. Well, we'll I'm see some guys who are more who are more. Uh, Current players, okay. So Cujo, you say yes. Corey Perry, no. Claude Giroux, no. Steven Stamkos, yes. Do you think Braden Point, if he continues what he's done so far in his career, yes. Who's another guy I can think of? Here's one that was an interesting conversation that I got into with some people recently. Phil Kessel. Oh. I'm going to say yes. Why? Because there's things about Phil Kessel before he even got to the NHL that kind of, you know, people forget Phil Kessel almost had his career derailed by, uh, by an illness. I can't remember. What, what was it again? What did he have? It was when he was with the Bruins. So had, not the hot dog eating syndrome. No, no, not that. <laughs> oh, it's gonna kill me for not remembering. But it was like, oh, testicular cancer. He had he had that. He won the oh. Bill Gaston Trophy for that. Uh, he was a top pick. He he has. I mean, he has won. I know he wasn't the center point of those Bengals teams, 
but you can't deny that that's something that is on his resume. A good American score in terms of what he's been, what he's done. Then I'm sure he's also won with the. Uh, he won Olympic silver medal at the Olympics. He's been t- he's been an all star. Uh, let's see here. There was another I, one. Just looking like there. I think there's a there is. I can make a good case for Phil Castle. Some might not. World yeah. Junior too. He was also a star at that as well. So he, throughout. <laughs> Different points of his career, he has proven to be a very good player. Yeah, he, I mean the durability too, like the fact that he's currently the the NHL's current Ironman holder for the well record. Actually, he holds the record for most games played in a season. Did it cheekily this way, played one shift, and then went off for the birth of his daughter. But is what it is. Um, I think he returned actually, like for the next game, and it was against Toronto. Now that I think about it. Uh, I think that was the game where Chickering should have got the penalty and they lost in overtime. And I was just, really? not- why do we always have to bring up bad memories? on this uh, I know, I know always, 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 but I, I don't think Kessel is, is one like he's, I, I don't even think he's close. Wow. I mean, he's close. He's close. But like, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't look at him and say, yeah, that guy's an absolute hall of famer. You know, like he may get in eventually if there's like a, a weak class and, you know, but I don't know. I, I wouldn't be upset if he never got into the hall. I, I think he's he's in that category. Um, I'm trying to think of maybe another another goalie that uh, potentially. Oh, Pecorine. I'm going to say no. Really? The one thing he has is, you know, I think he what he has the most wins by finish goalie. Is that the one he has? Yeah, but he was like one of the best goaltenders of the generation. Would you go that far for Pecorine, though? Oh, I think so. No, you don't think? I don't. I just don't. I, I personally don't think so. I think. Like, I'm not saying it like, oh, for sure, like. I just don't. He has a good resume. I just don't know if it's got a Vesna, Vesna, two time finalists, a third place Vesna season. One, two, three, four, five, six time All Star. Hart nominee was fourth, seventh, eighth, twelfth. Maybe potentially down the road. I'm just trying to see if, like, internationally, what was his kind of okay so he's won a world championship uh, i think he's a hall of famer. i think he's a hall of famer i think maybe for some of the international stuff too you can maybe we can make the make the case <laughs> he's not going to be like right away i think it'll take some time for people to recognize pecker <laughs> but last I, I last one last one for you and then we gotta we gotta roll Unless you got a couple for me that you want to throw. Uh, out we'll, we'll save that. Trust me. I think we'll have a lot of Hall of Fame debates down the road. True. Henrik Lundqvist. Yes. First ballot next year. Hmm. If Luongo was, I think Lundqvist is, should be yes. I think he will be as well. I think he will be as well. They're very comparable, Lunkfist and, and Luongo, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, they are. Uh, all right, that's going to do it for us here today on the podcast. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked On Leafs podcast on all podcast platforms and receive daily Leafs content. Follow myself on Twitter at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morissuti. Follow the show as well at Locked On Leaf. Go ahead, leave a comment down below, smash that like button. And uh, if you're listening on iTunes, we really appreciate it if you leave uh, a nice little review and uh, and some feedback. That would be greatly, greatly appreciated. All right, we'll be back with another episode for you guys tomorrow. But until then, keep it locked right here on Locked On Leafs.